<laughs> All right. So everybody's here today, so probably nobody's gonna watch this video anyway. But that's okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um. So <laughs> today's section is limits at infinity, right? Limits at infinity. Um. Limits at infinity and infinite limits are two different things. Limits at infinity and limits of infinity are two very different things. Limits at infinity, what we're looking at today is basically what's happening on the left and the right side of these things. That's what we're really truly looking at today. What's happening on the far left side? What's happening on the far right side? And how do we express that in some sort of notation? Like that's, that's really what we're looking at today. These are, all right. Um, but, you know, how does that relate to infinite limits? Well, remember that if I were talking about infinite limits where I say, okay, the, uh, the value of the limit as x goes to some number was equal to infinity. So what's the difference? Well, the first option, limits at infinity, is the limit as x goes to infinity. What's happening on the left and right? The second option, which is infinite limits, are, okay, I'm taking the x value to some number, and the output is going to infinity. So it's got, it's got to do with the x value going to infinity or the y value going to infinity. If the y value is going to infinity, that's a limit at infinity. If the, or sorry, that's an infinite limit. If the x value is going to infinity, that's the limit at infinity. So that's, that's really kind of the difference here. But again, what we're looking at is, What's happening on the left side? What's happening on the right side? Um, we had this idea of, or this technique of, <clears throat> where's that example? Where we divide by the highest power in the denominator. That is going to be very useful here very, for the foreseeable future. That's going to be very, very useful. Dividing by the highest power of x in the denominator. That is really going to help us find limits at infinity pretty much every time. Okay? The only time where this is not useful is when the limit as x goes to infinity also goes to infinity or negative infinity, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Okay? But for rational functions, this is very, very, very useful. So let's take a look here. This is where we left off. Compute the limit as x goes to infinity of the square root of x squared plus 1 minus x. Now, you might be thinking, is there any way to do direct substitution? Like, is that even a thing with infinite limits? And I say yes, but we have to be very careful. Because think about it this way. If I were to try to do direct substitution, this would be like infinity squared plus 1 minus infinity. Okay, and, and you have to think about like the idea of what it means to be an infinity. It just means to be a really big number, right? It's just a really big number. So if I square a really big number, what happens? It gets really bigger, right? If I add 1 to a really big number, it just keeps getting bigger. If I square root that number, it gets smaller. But no matter how, I make, how big I make the inside of that thing, even if I take the square root of it, it's still going to eventually go to infinity, right? Maybe not as fast, but it goes to infinity eventually. But then there's this idea of I'm subtracting away infinity. Okay, now that, that takes some thinking. That takes some thinking of, okay, well, then what's bigger and what's smaller then? Because if this ends up being bigger than this infinity, well, then the whole thing's going to go to infinity because infinity minus a smaller number is just eventually going to get to, get to infinity anyway. But if this number is smaller than this number, then it's going to be smaller number by minus bigger number. It's going to get negative, and it's going to keep going on into the negative direction for infinity. So this idea of subtracting away is, is not good. This is, it's, it's not going to help us use direct substitution here. So there must be some sort of algebraic way to solve this thing. Okay, well, if we have this x squared plus 1 minus x, do you remember that whole thing about um, unrationalizing the denominator, like where we multiply by the conjugate? We're going to do that same idea here. You may be thinking, well, there is no denominator. Well, there's always a denominator. There's always a denominator of 1, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a rational function. 
I'm going to turn this into a rational function. And then see if I can somehow reduce it out based on that. Okay, I'm going to multiply by the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x over the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. Okay, that is the conjugate of the numerator. Basically, the minus sign turns plus. Now, how does that help us again? When we, when we go to FOIL this out, my first, I get square root of x squared plus 1 times the square root of x squared plus 1, which is just x squared plus 1. The, the house comes off, so it's x squared plus 1. My outers, okay, I've got positive x squared x squared plus 1. Inners is negative x square root of x squared plus 1, which will cancel out. Again, that's why we multiply by the conjugate, to get those things to cancel out. Now, the last here, negative x times positive x. Negative x squared. Ooh, now that's nice. That's nice. That's convenient right there. That's very convenient because x squared minus x squared will cancel, leaving us with 1 over the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. Okay, now let's see if now we can use direct substitution. Let's see if now we can reason it through by using direct substitution. Because remember that this is really just essentially the limit as x goes to infinity of this thing. Okay, let's see. Well, this is 1 over infinity squared plus 1 plus infinity. Okay, now I've, I don't have a minus anymore, but I have a plus. Okay. If I square infinity, it gets even bigger, right? There's no reducing that. Okay, plus 1 keeps getting bigger. Square root it makes it a little bit smaller, but eventually as I keep plugging in x values, won't it go to infinity anyway? But even if I square root it, it's, it's going to make it smaller, but it's, it's still going to eventually lead to infinity. Plus infinity. Only going to make it bigger, right? So this is essentially 1 over infinity. The entire bottom will go to infinity. Now, what is 1 over infinity? What will that go to? What's 1 over a really big number? 0. It will go to 0. Right? Why does 1 over a really big number go to 0? Well, think about it. We did this yesterday. Well, on the video. 1 tenth. 1 hundred. 1 thousand. 1 million. 1 ten million. That number, if I make the number in the denominator bigger and bigger and bigger, that will eventually go to zero. That number will eventually go to zero. Okay? That number will keep getting smaller and smaller and eventually go to zero. So we can do this algebraic process of unrationalizing the, uh, the denominator, and, and that might help us along. Okay, now I'm going to teach you this, this kind of tricky... Um, a tricky technique to solve these. Okay. So I am going to evaluate the limit as x goes to 2 from the positive of r tangent of 1 over x minus 2. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, we're talking about limits at infinity. Why am I making the x value go to 2? This whole section should be about the x value going to infinity. Well, let me show you something. Um, I am going to make some value t of 1 over x minus 2. Okay? You see how this is kind of like a function within another function? This is almost like a composition. I've got 1 over x minus 2 within our tangent of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify things, and I'm going to say that 1 over x minus 2 is just t. So let me ask you this. What is the limit as x goes to 2 from the positive? of 1 over x minus 2. What is that going to equal? Can I do direct substitution? No. Can I do any manipulation of that? Not really. There's no factoring to do. So maybe it might be a good idea to look at it on my calculator. Okay, I've got 1 over x minus 2. Because essentially, before I graph this, what's going to happen at 2? 
If this is a rational function, what should I see it to? Isn't that a vertical asymptote? Anywhere where the denominator equals zero is a vertical asymptote, right? So that's going to be a vertical asymptote. So my intuition is like, okay, if that's a vertical asymptote, I bet this goes to infinity or negative infinity, right? For a, ver for a vertical asymptote to exist, it must either go to negative infinity or positive infinity. Let's check to see which one. Okay, what's happening at 2? Well, the, the full limit does not exist, right? But what's happening at 2 from the positive? Where's it going? To positive infinity, right? This is going to infinity. Okay. Well, if I know this is true, if I know the limit as x goes to 2 from the positive, well, 1 over x minus 2 goes to infinity, what I can say is then, well, then I can substitute in and say, I can actually evaluate the limit as t goes to infinity of our tangent of t. Okay, this whole thing, I can kind of bring this limit in, apply it to the inside piece, and then find the limit of the solution. Like for what, what I'm saying here is, I apply the limit as x goes to 2 from the positive to this inside piece. I evaluated it to be positive infinity. So now I can go and directly, sub, I can substitute in, okay, now I'm not going to find the limit as x goes to 2, but as x goes to infinity. Okay, I'm going to find the limit as x goes to infinity, and I'm, I'm replacing the variable now, t goes to infinity of our tangent of t. See, I've already evaluated that piece on the inside to call it t. Okay, well, let's, let's evaluate that. Think about our tangent. Remember, our tangent is the like capital capital T tangent, right? Capital T tangent. Okay, capital T tangent is a restriction that should more look like a half circle, but that's okay. Um, capital T tangent is restricted to the first and fourth quadrants, right? Negative pi over two to pi over two. So as I make T. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That means it's going to go here, 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 here. Right? Okay, what's happening to tangent as I increase? Like, what's happening as if I increase the value of tangent, as I increase the value of t, what is that going to do to our tangent? Well, isn't that making the angle measure bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Right until it reaches that pi over two, what's it going to go toward? It's going to go toward pi over two. Okay, so I can evaluate the limit as x goes to as t goes to. Excuse me, I replace the variable as t goes to infinity of our tangent of t to be pi over two. So that means my full limit, the full thing here, is pi over two. So the the technique is really piecing it out. Treating it almost like a composition of two functions. Because if you can if you can decompose it and see, okay, the limit as this is this, the limit as this piece now, I can treat it as something different, then you might be able to solve it in a different way. Okay? We're gonna do that here again in a second. If that that confuses you, we're gonna do it one more time. Um, we're gonna look at um, e to the x. Uh, let me ask you this, Re reminding ourselves way back to e to the x. Like the first time we learned it was back, way back in algebra two. Remember, e to the x is just the exponential function with the um, that e value, that 2.71828 um, as the base. Remember that as I go to negative infinity of e to the x, as I go to the left direction of e to the x, where is it going to go to? Zero, right? It's going to be getting closer and closer and closer to zero. It's that horizontal asymptote of an exponential function. Okay. Let's use that here. Evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 from the negative direction of e to the 1 over x. Okay, do you see again how we've got a function within another function? I've got a 1 over x within an exponent. I've got a 1 over x within an exponent. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, well, then, then t has got to be 1 over x. Set a variable equal to that, that innermost function, 1 over x in this case. And now let's evaluate the limit. Let's apply this limit to this piece in here. 
The limit as x goes to 0 from the negative of 1 over x is what? Again, no direct substitution here. So we've got to think through it logically. Let's look at our graph to see. Again, if I can't do direct substitution and I've got a 0 in the denominator, that's implying that I have some sort of vertical asymptote. So it's either going to go to negative infinity or positive infinity. Let's see which one. Let's just take away all of that stuff. 1 over x, our parent hyperbola. OK, 0 from the left. 0 from the left. What's it going to? Negative infinity. This is negative infinity. So now what I can do is I can say, this is then equivalent to the limit as t goes to negative infinity. The output of the limit of e of t okay again i'm like decomposing it i'm deconstructing it i'm taking the one over x applying the limit just to that see what happens so that i can apply the limit as x goes to or t goes to that of the substituted in one t is one over x so e to the t so what is this now well think about e to the e to the x Right? Which is the same thing as like e to the t. If I keep putting negative exponents in there, what's it going to go to? As I keep going negative and negative on e to the x, if I go to negative infinity, where's it going to? Hi, Mr. Weber. Hi, Mac. How are you? Excellent. How are you doing? I have something for Riley. I'm just going to talk. Okay. I can do it too. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Mr. Weber. Bye. 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 <laughs> um, so what is what is e to the t going to go to? Zero. So I can say that this whole thing, of course, this whole thing goes to zero. Okay. So if we're able to, we can deconstruct it, find the limits separately, and then and then solve. I think that's the last one we'll do like that. Now we're just going to do a... I want you to think about this. Mm. The, the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x. The limit as I make x bigger and bigger and bigger of sine of x. Okay. What's going to happen? Next. Wouldn't it just repeat over and over again? Right. Like, think about the graph, right? I see what he's saying. Sine starts here, right? Yeah. Cosine starts above. Right? And that's going to continue. Should have flattened that a little bit more. That's going to continue on forever and ever, right? Will it ever reach any one number as x keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Isn't it going to oscillate between negative 1 and positive 1 forever and ever and ever until, and it's never going to stop, right? So as x keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, no matter how, okay, I want to glue, that's okay. Um, okay. As x keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger to infinity, it's never going to shrink to one number. Okay. So at the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x does not exist. So what I'm implying here, this is the first time that we've had an infinite limit not exist. It, it, it may not exist, and that's okay too. If it doesn't reduce down to one number or one thing or go up forever or go down forever, then it, it may not even exist. And I kind of implied, I kind of implied the next piece of our lesson just, just a second ago. Hey guys, do you remember back to Algebra 2? Um, those of you who had me, we talked about the end behavior dance. I think I referenced it a little bit earlier this year. Right, the end behavior dance, right? It goes positive, 
negative, positive, negative, right? We knew positive, uh, positive leading coefficient, right? Positive or negative, negative leading coefficient, and then um, even or odd, right? And that's that's degree. The the end behavior, yes, sir. Sure. The end behavior of that, of any polynomial function, the end behavior depends on the leading coefficient and the degree. Positive even, negative even, positive odd, negative odd. Now, way back in Algebra 2, if I gave you something like this, let me get a new page here. If I gave you something like um, 2x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus I don't care. All I really cared about was that this was a positive leading coefficient and an even degree. So we had said back in Algebra 2, okay, positive even. We had used this notation. As x approaches infinity, f of x goes to positive infinity. On the right side, the function goes up. On the left side, the function also goes up, right? This is the notation that we used. We did that in Algebra 2, and you guys hated writing that notation. You want to know something that we can say now? This is really equivalent to saying the limit as x goes to infinity, positive infinity, equals positive infinity. These two statements are equivalent, but we couldn't use the limit notation back in algebra 2 because you guys would have freaked out because you don't know about that. We didn't understand that yet. We can say now this is really equivalent to saying, okay, the limit as x goes to negative infinity also is in positive infinity. These two statements are really equivalent now. It's a much more shorthand way to write it. But we didn't know the limit notation yet. Okay? So we can use the end behavior along with limits at infinity to define what's going on in any polynomial. So let's take a look here. Find the limit as x to the third, or sorry, as x goes to infinity of x to the third, and then the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x to the third. Well, think about it. This is a positive leading coefficient, odd degree. Positive even, negative even. Positive a, ah, up on the right, down on the left, which makes sense because that's just my parent cubic function, right? If I go to graph that, that just looks like this, right? That should be in our head. So that makes sense that it's going to go up on the right, down on the left. Now, how can we write that now? We can say that the limit as x goes to positive infinity, meaning on the right side of this graph, let's call it f of x. On the right side of this graph, it goes up. As x goes to positive infinity, it goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, what's it going to do? Go down forever. It's going to go to negative infinity. Okay? This is the new way to write end behavior. This is the more formal, the more calculus version of writing end behavior. And we can evaluate the limit as x goes to positive infinity or the limit as x goes to negative infinity. Okay? All right, so let's take a look here. You know, thinking about it in terms of like, if I had not, if I don't think about end behavior, and you're maybe thinking like, ooh, maybe I can directly substitute. Yeah, I would be careful about that because you'd be taking infinity squared minus infinity. And you might be tempted to say, I'm going to put this in red, so don't do this. You might be tempted to say like zero because you, you never know. Infinity squared is just going to keep going to infinity, right? So maybe infinity squared is just infinity. And maybe, maybe that's zero. That's wrong logic. You can't use that, okay? Because what's bigger? Well, infinity squared is going to get bigger faster. I guess you can think about it that way. 
So minus infinity is what's going to happen with that? So here's a better way to think about it. Since this is polynomial, I can use the idea of end behavior. Positive even, right? Positive leading coefficient, even degree. Positive even, positive leading coefficient, even degree. Okay, positive even. Up on the right, up on the left. So I can say, and look, what do I care about? I care about the right. Do I, am I asked about the left? No, I'm not even asked about the left. I'm only caring about this piece. The limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus x is infinity. It's going to go up forever. Okay, so it's equal to infinity. You know what? You know how to uh, to evaluate this algebraically? You would look at it like this. Instead of subtraction, you'd look at it as okay. The limit as x goes to infinity of let's factor out an x. And now you can directly substitute. Now you can say, okay, well, this is infinity times infinity minus 1. Well, infinity minus 1 is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Minusing 1 from infinity just keeps sending it to infinity. So that's like saying infinity times infinity, which will end up going to infinity anyway. Okay. But again, it's so much easier if you think about the end behavior. What's happening? Let's take a look here. Now, end behavior, when we think about a rational function, you know, I cannot use the positive even, negative even, positive about, negative about thing anymore. No, that's just for polynomials. So here is what I have to think about here. Okay, here's what I have to think about. Think about a rational function. Let's put it in order on the bottom. Remember back, I think I referenced this in the video. If you had me as a teacher, I use the top heavy, bottom heavy thing. Right? What is that referencing? I'm referencing the degree. The degree. In the numerator and then the degree in the denominator. And we memorized that if it was a top heavy function, if it's a top heavy function, then it does not have a horizontal asymptote. Right? If it's top heavy, it does not have a horizontal asymptote. If it's bottom heavy, it will have one at zero. And if it's equal, we take the numerator divided by the denominator in terms of its leading coefficient. So let me ask you this. Does this have a horizontal asymptote? No. This is top heavy. It does not have a horizontal asymptote. What does that mean? That means that as I increase in my x values, it's either going to keep getting bigger or keep getting smaller. It's not going to go to a single number. That's out the window because this is top heavy. So it's not going to decline to a single number. It's not going to, go, the limit as x goes to infinity is not going to go to a single number. It's either going to go to positive infinity or negative infinity. Well, how do we, how do we figure that out then? Well, we jump back to our very beginning and say, well, let's just divide by the highest power of x in the denominator. Highest power of x in the denominator is just x. So this is going to turn into x squared over x plus x over x, negative x over x plus 3 over x. Okay, so this is x plus 1 over negative 1 plus 3 over x. That does not reduce, right? So let's directly substitute now. Let's plug in infinity. Let's find the limit as x goes to infinity of x plus 1 over negative 1 plus 3 over x. Okay, so that's infinity plus 1, meaning a really big number. And then this is negative 1 plus, what's wrong with that? Did I screw something up? Okay, I heard some mumbo jumbo. Um, 3 over x. 
What what happens there? As x goes to infinity, it goes to zero. Ah. So infinity plus one is infinity over negative one. So what does this go to? Negative infinity. It dies down, not up. Your intuition may have thought that it might die, it may go up, but it does not, it goes down. So I know on the right side of this graph, it's going to eventually go downward. That's what we can say about that. Okay. Where did the zero come from again? Um, yeah, plugging in infinity to this. Like three over a really big number is just going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Just like one over a really big number does the same thing. Okay. okay, two more examples to do. First one here. We're going to sketch this graph. We're going to sketch the graph of y. Thank you. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't do his homework while I was not here yesterday. So he normally gets an hour lunch on Friday. He did not get an hour lunch on Friday. Oh, wow. Good. I'll do that later. Um, sketch the graph of y is equal to x minus 2 to the fourth plus x plus 1 to the third times x minus 1 by doing two things. We're going to find its intercept, both x and y intercept, and then find its end behavior. Guys, this is asking for the end behavior. What's going to happen as x goes to infinity and, then, and as x goes to negativity? What's going to happen on the right and then the left side? Let's start by finding the intercept. Let's start by finding the intercept. Well, it's in this form. Look at this. This is nice. This is convenient. Where are the x-intercepts? 2, negative 1, positive 1. Oh, that's, not, that's convenient right there. Okay, so we're at 2, we're at negative 1, let's, let's use red, we're at 2, we're at negative 1, and we're at positive 1. We're at 2, we're at negative 1, and we're at positive 1. I don't know how high or low this thing goes just quite yet, we'll figure that out in a second. But those at least are my intercepts. Now, do you remember the rules about multiplicities? Do you remember the rules about multiplicities? If it's an even multiplicity, remember what it does at that point? Anybody remember? It bounces at that point. It bounces off the x-axis at that point. If it's an odd multiplicity, and how do we know multiplicity? Even or odd, I'm looking at the degree. Because this is a root at 2 four times. This is a root at negative 1 three times. If it's an odd multiplicity, what happens in there? It bends through. Right. This is a bend. If it's a multiplicity of 1, what happens? It goes straight through. That's a G. Straight through. Okay, now, we're going to use that here in a second. What I want to do next is find a y-intercept. Now, for any y-intercept, if I want to find a y-intercept, all I need to do is just plug in 0 for x, because it should be a 0 comma some value, right? So let's plug in 0 for x. 0 minus 2 to the 4th, 0 plus 1 to the 3rd, 0 minus 1. Okay, so that's negative 2 to the 4th, 1 to the 3rd, times negative 1. So I guess in essence what we're really left over with is negative 2 to the 4th times 1, okay, times negative 1, negative 16. So the y-intercept is negative 16. All right, so now I know that down here, let's go by fives. Negative five, negative 10, negative 15. So somewhere down right there. Now let's determine the end behavior. Okay, we want to fill in these blanks. 
the limit as x goes to infinity of this function and the limit as x goes to negative infinity of this function. All right. Think about whether this is positive or negative, positive even or negative even, positive odd or negative odd. Okay, I don't really need to foil this all out. What's going to be my biggest power on x in here? x to the fourth. This is going to give me x to the fourth plus something plus something plus something. This is going to give me an x to the third plus something plus something plus something. And this is going to give me an x plus, well, no, minus 1. So all in total, what's that going to get me? What's my highest power on x? x to the 8. Add the exponents. Right? So I know this is a, a degree of 8, meaning it's going to either go up or down together. Well, if these are all positives, Positive times a positive times a positive is another positive. So this is a positive even. Okay, positive even. Touchdown. Positive even. So positive, positive. Okay, so that means it goes up, up. Let's use this idea of bouncing and bending through. Okay, so it's going to bounce at negative 2. That means it's going to, oh, wait a sec. Positive even, right? Yeah? Yeah, okay. It's going to go straight through. Yeah, it's backwards. Why is it backwards? Because this should go down. But it's going, oh, oh, I'm so stupid. That's at positive two. Oh, my gosh. I'm losing my brain. That's at po it's going to bounce at positive 2. Bounce. And then it's going to bend. Oh, sorry. It's going to go straight through at positive 1. And then it's going to bend through. There we go. Just a sketch, folks. Just a sketch. Yeah. Questions about that? No? I am going to let that last example go by the wayside. We're not going to do that last example. All right, so I'm going to stop my video here. And.